So in economics, a good is something that you can buy or sell. It's a service, it's a product, it's, it's something um, that can be traded in a market. Um, and there's specific types of goods. Um, there are things called private goods, um, which meet two specific requirements. So a private good um, is excludable, which means you can stop people from using it. If you sell somebody a piece of candy, um, them consuming that candy makes it so other people can't consume that candy too. Um, it is excludable. If you have um, a hotel, you can stop people from using the hotel. You can stop people from accessing the rooms. Um, you have keys, and so the guests get a key, and then they can access the rooms. If they don't pay for that good or for that service, then they're excluded from it. And so if you have some sort of good or service that you can exclude people from, it is excludable. Um, a private good is also rival, which means if somebody uses it, other people can't use it too. So if we go back to the hotel example, um, a hotel room is rival. If somebody rents out a hotel room, um, nobody else can use that hotel room. They have it. It takes it away. And so the, the whole hotel can be full. It can be at capacity. Um, and so if, it, if you have a good or a service that is private, um, it is excludable and it is rival. Um, this is most things that you see in a store. If you can buy it um, and consume it, that makes it by default like excludable and rival. If you eat a piece of candy, other people can't eat that piece of candy. Um, a public good, on the other hand, breaks both of these requirements. A public good is non-excludable, which means you can't stop people from using it. Um, if somebody, like, if it exists in the world, people can use it and there's no way to stop it. Um, the canonical example that you see in textbooks here is something like fireworks. Um, if there are fireworks in the sky that you pay to light off, there's no way to stop your neighbors from looking at it too. Um, there's no way to stop people from coming and, and watching. Um, this happens often with like fancy fireworks shows um, after football games or after baseball games or for 4th of July events. Um, where you have to pay money to get inside the stadium and there's like a concert often with huge fireworks. Um, but there's nothing you can do to stop people from parking up on a hill by the stadium and then they see the same fireworks show. They don't get the concert, but they'll probably hear parts of the concert. Um, you can't stop people from using it. And that means you can't charge the people outside of the stadium for looking at the fireworks. Um, public goods are also non-rival, which means you if one person use it, it doesn't make it so other people can't use it too. Um, so again, with the firework example, if one person if one person pays to be in the stadium and looks at the fireworks, that does like them looking at the fireworks does not take away anybody else's ability to see the fireworks too. It's not like you suck the energy from the fireworks into your eyes or something. That would be weird. Um, it exists out in the world, you're consuming it, and because you're consuming it, it doesn't actually prevent anybody else from consuming it either, um, which is tricky. When you have these types of situations here, if something is non-excludable and non-rival, if you're a private company or a private firm or a person that's trying to sell something, you don't want to sell a public good because um, it's something you can't stop people from using. So if, if they don't buy it from you, they can still just use it. And if they use it, it doesn't take away anybody else's ability to use it. So you can't like have control over the item. And so there's no way you can make a profit or do anything with these public goods. And so as a result, they are underprovided in society. Um, private companies don't want to do these things because they can't make money off of it. Um, they can't exclude people from it and it's not a rival thing. Um, we can actually classify, we can use this, this idea of excludability and rivalry to classify all sorts of goods. So we've already looked here at public goods and private goods. Um, you can also have private bads, which are essentially goods, but we, things that we don't like. So like pollution is a bad. Um, you also have these unique mixes here. If you have something that is excludable, but not rival, it is something called a club good. A good example of this is like the internet or a cable service. Um, if you have a house with cable in it, you have to pay um, a cable bill every month to get access to all of the channels. But if your neighbor gets hooked up to cable um, and everybody in your apartment building gets hooked up to cable, 
or everybody in your neighborhood gets hooked up, it doesn't actually degrade the cable signal. It doesn't make it worse for people. And so it's not rival um, having kind of um, more people use it. It doesn't take away your ability to do it, but it is excludable. The cable company can um, make it so that you have to pay to get the cable box and you have to have a subscription. And so it turns into, it's not quite a public good because they essentially put a gate on it and say, you must pay, but once you pay, like you consuming cable doesn't reduce the amount of cable that exists out in the world. And so it turns into something called a club good. Um, from uh, up in this other corner, you have something called a common pool resource, which is the opposite problem where it's something that is not excludable, anybody can use it, but it is rival, um, which means as people use it, it takes away other people's ability to use it. Um, a, the classic example of this is um, in New England um, back in like the 1800s and in England itself back in like the 1700s and 1800s, um, there was this concept of the commons, which was this common grazing field where people could bring their animals to graze and it was just kind of public property. Um, anybody could show up and have their animals graze. It was just there. And so it has the feel of a public good because anybody can access it. It's not excludable. You can't stop people from going to the commons and grazing their animals. But it is rival because there's only so much grass. And if too many cows come and eat up the grass, then it will disappear um, and it can, it can be bad. There are all sorts of common pool resource issues. And we'll talk about this in a future session um, in the environment, especially. So forests and fishing stocks, those are all common pool resources where you can't really stop people from fishing in the ocean. Good luck putting like fences around sections of the ocean. Um, but it's rival. As you overfish, the fish start disappearing. As you overforest, trees start disappearing. Um, but you can't stop people from doing it. And so it turns into this common pool resource here. So this, this is kind of a helpful way of, of categorizing any good that you see out in the world um, based on its excludability and its rivalry. So when, when you have a question on a problem set or an exam, or if somebody says, this is a public good, um, you often see this in political debates too, where people will say um, healthcare is a public good or housing is a public good. Um, in the economics world, that has an official definition. Um, so housing being a public good means it has to be not rivalrous and not excludable. So it means you can't, there, there has to be no way to exclude people from using it, um, which in the case of housing is excludable. Um, we have doors, um, we have keys, you can exclude people from using housing. And it has to be not rival, which means if one person uses an apartment or a house, um, it doesn't take away the ability for other people to use apartments and houses. And so saying from an economics perspective, saying that housing is a public good isn't necessarily true because it's not excludable and not rivalrous. If you want to argue that housing is like a human right and everybody should have access to it and it should be treated as a public good, that is a valid argument and there are, there are reasons for that, especially when we get to like healthcare. Healthcare based on this right here, on this matrix is not a public good. Um, you can exclude people from getting healthcare. You can, like it's rival. If you show up at the doctor's office that takes away somebody else's ability to also be at the doctor's office treated by that doctor. There is scarcity there. Um, and so saying that healthcare should be a public good doesn't really work in an economics framework. But from a human rights framework, from a social justice framework, other issues, there are valid arguments for that. Deep down inside, most public goods that you think of are not actually public goods. There are very, very few pure public goods out in the world. Um, because as you scale up the amount of public goods that you're providing, you run into rivalry issues and you run into excludability issues. Um, for instance, freeways. We think of roads and bridges and freeways in the United States as public goods. Um, they're free. The government provided them for us. We can use them whenever we want. Um, at a low level, they're technically not excludable. Anybody can get on the freeway whenever they want unless you live like in Chicago or other places in the Northeast um, where you have to pay tolls on interstates. Most interstates in the United States are free. If you want to get on um, any freeway, you just get on um, and it's totally fine. Um, so in that sense, it's non-excludable. 
Um, you can exclude it, and some places do, but you don't. From the rivalry side, technically, you getting on the freeway at a normal freeway load isn't going to make it so somebody else can't get on the freeway. You'll add a little bit of traffic, but you'll also move fairly quickly down the road. Um, but as that starts scaling up, during rush hour, for instance, adding one additional car onto the freeway makes it so that other cars can't fit on. Um, and it suddenly becomes a rivalrous situation. And so that moves us from what we consider it to be a public good into um, non-excludable and rivalrous. It becomes kind of a common pool resource. Um, if you can exclude things, like with tolls, then freeways can actually become private goods because they are rival and you can stop people from getting on them with um, tolls. And so people will stop using them and it becomes more of like a private good like you would find in a store. So pure public goods, the reason why like the most common examples that you see in textbooks are things like fireworks and the sun. The sun is not excludable and it's not rivalrous. Air is not excludable, not rivalrous. Um, you can imagine a situation where air could be rivalrous or excludable. You could sell people clean air. Um, the movie The Lorax, where you watch that clip, um, one of the, the major plot points in that movie is that there's this, the, this capitalist in their society who's discovered how to sell clean air. And they build this whole dome around the city where um, he's selling air which is technically non-excludable, non-rivalrous, but because the world had become so polluted, it became rivalrous and excludable. He could raise prices and exclude people from buying it. And so it moved from the public good to the private good world. Um, national defense is often given as an example of a public good because um, if you have like nuclear weapons surrounding your country and you, can, you have like missile defense system, or if you have an army that can go invade other countries, you benefit from that army regardless of how many taxes you pay. Like just because we live in the country, we have like national security um, and national defense. And so that's technically non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Um, another common example that you'll see is lighthouses. Um, if a lighthouse exists, um, there's no way to charge boats for seeing it. And so it is not excludable. And it's not rivalrous. If one boat sees the light, it doesn't take away the ability of another boat to see the light. And so lighthouses are typically seen as a public good. But some economic historical research has found that um, lighthouses in the 1800s and 1700s found out a way to exclude access to them. Not that they could like blind sailors and make it so they couldn't see unless they paid a, f paid a fee, but they built in a lighthouse fee when boats docked. And so if you docked at a port that had a lighthouse nearby, you essentially paid like a lighthouse tax, um, which then funded the lighthouse. And so that was one way of excluding people from, from accessing the, the benefits of that lighthouse. If you wanted to skip that fee, you'd have to go up shore to some other dock, but then you'd also run into a lighthouse there and you'd have to eventually pay the fee. And so it turns it into kind of a club good here, um, where it's it's not rival. Again, you looking at the lighthouse doesn't prevent other people from looking at it, but it is excludable. Okay, so what I want you to do um, right now is pause this video after I explain what's here. These are a whole bunch of different um, goods or services that exist out in the world. I want you to determine if these are um, excludable or rivalrous and then determine if they're a public good, a private good, a common pool resource, or a club good, depending on excludability and rivalry. So if you go back to here, remember this matrix here, you might wanna write it down, or if you're following on, along in the slides, just have this slide open. Um, so I want you to look through these different examples here and take a couple minutes, write down what you think each of these are based on excludability and rivalry. So make sure you determine if it's excludable, determine if it's rivalrous, and that should tell you which of these four options the good should be. So go ahead and do that, and I will wait for you to come back. And hopefully you did it. Um, we're back. So let's talk about each of these to see how rivalrous it is and how excludable it is. So if you have a free public lecture held at a university, that feels on its face to be public because it has the word public in there. 
So technically, it is non-excludable. We don't want, like we're not charging for people to show up. Um, but it is rivalrous, depending on how big of a venue you're holding the lecture in. If it's a small room that fits like 20 people, um, as soon as you hit 20 people, you have to turn people away. And so it's no longer non, it's, it's not non-rivalrous. Um, one person showing up to the lecture takes away the ability for somebody else to attend that same lecture. So even though it says a free public lecture, it becomes more of um, a club good, where it is technic like we say it's not excludable, or it becomes a common pool resource, not a club good, um, where it's not excludable. We could exclude if we had tickets, um, but it is definitely rival. So as more people show up, it takes the ability of, of people to attend. So we end up with a common pool resource, even though it says a public lecture. Okay, noise produced by aircraft around an airport. This is a public good, or rather a public bad. Um, it is non-excludable. Um, you can't buy your way out of not hearing the noise. Um, there's no way to exclude people from hearing that noise um, unless somebody bought like soundproofing equipment and built like a big box around their house or something. That would be weird. And it is non-rivalrous which means if one person hears um, an engine from a plane landing, it doesn't like suck up all of the sound into their ears and makes it so their neighbors can't hear it. Everybody can hear it. One person hearing it doesn't take away the ability for other people to hear it too. And so you essentially have a public bad that is both non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Um, a forest used by the community to collect firewood um, is a common pool resource. It is non-excludable. It's just a forest out in the world. Um, there's likely no fence around it, no gate that you have to pay at to get into the forest. Um, but it is rivalrous. If too many people go and chop down trees, then you're left with no forest. And so you end up with, um, so if we talk about rivalry and excludability, it is non-excludable, but it is rivalrous. And so it's a common pool resource. Hamilton tickets, that is a private good. It is both rivalrous. If one person buys a ticket to go to the show, um, it prevents other people from doing it. And it is excludable. You can stop people from going to the show by having the ticket. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a good definition of a private good. A public park. This is tricky too because it has the term public in it. So it sounds like it should be public. And at a low scale, it is. It would be non-excludable if it's just open to the public. Anybody can go into it. Um, there's no fence, there's no ticketing system, you can just use it. And so in that situation, it's, it's non-excludable. At a low level, it is non-rivalrous. If you show up at a park, that doesn't make it so that other people have to leave the park to make room for you. Um, it, like At a low scale, anybody can attend. But if the park gets too crowded, this is kind of like the freeway example, then you're gonna have way too many people in the park and then one person's going to have to leave and it becomes rivalrous. And so at a low level, it is kind of a public good, but as you get higher and higher, it becomes non-excludable and rival. And so it's a common pool resource to some extent. Bird scooters or Lime scooters or Uber scooters, those scooters that you see all around downtown Atlanta, um, that is something that is rivalrous. Um, if you use a scooter, it makes it so other people can't use the scooter and it is excludable. Um, the only way to make the scooter work is to pay with the app. Otherwise, the, the wheels are locked and you can't use it. And so it is a private good. Um, some people consider them to be private bads because they get left all over the city and cause all sorts of negative consequences. They're not the greatest. Um, but it's not a common pool resource. It's not a club good. It's just a public or it's a private good. Okay. The reason we care about this is public goods are a tricky issue that we need to, to think about, um, especially when we think about market failures. Um, public goods are naturally underprovided because there's no incentive in the market using the, the invisible hand idea to provide these things. Um, there's no incentive to build a public park if you are a private firm because you're not gonna be able to charge admission and there's no way for you to recoup those costs. And so you're just giving money away to let people play at a park, um, which is good for society. We like that, we like having parks, there's benefits we get from that. But as an individual firm, that stinks for you. 
um, with fireworks. Um, if you really, really like fireworks and you get utility from lighting fireworks, cool. Um, you can buy all the fancy expensive fireworks for your neighborhood or in your neighborhood and you'll be the one house doing it. Um, but nobody's going to, you can't charge admission for it. Um, because if people don't want to charge, don't want to pay your fee to watch their fireworks, it can just like cross the street and watch the fireworks. Um, or stay in their house or climb on the roof or do something to still watch the fireworks without paying the, the excludability fee. Um, and so it's going to be underprovided um, because nobody's going to want to, to provide it. Um, they're also tricky because they cause free riding. Um, if we think about public goods in a game theory world, um, you essentially have it's a hare hunting and a stag hunting situation. Um, where if enough people provide the public good and pay for it, everybody else benefits from it. Um, this is a problem that's faced by all sorts of things like PBS and NPR. Um, in order for them to provide programming, um, to, ver to provide shows like Sesame Street before Sesame Street was bought out by HBO um, or Daniel Tiger or any of these other PBS shows, they have to have enough money to do that. Um, to generate these things, to create all things considered, or to create planet money, um, different NPR shows. Um, but once they get enough people paying, um, the rest of us benefit from it, and we don't have to pay. Um, if we were in class, I would ask, with a show of hands, how many of you have donated to an NPR station or to PBS? And I would guess very few of you have. Um, I have, but it's only because of guilt. Um, because they're really good every few months of saying like you need to pay us because you are benefiting from our services but you are not paying and that is a totally rational thing to do because other people are paying so the incentives in public goods situations are to um, free ride and to not pay because if you don't pay and enough other people pay you still get the public good and there's no real reason for you to to pay for it um, at the same time Public goods are positive externalities. There are benefits that society gets if public goods are provided, and it makes society better off. Um, it's good that we have a freeway system. It's good that we have a national defense system. It's good that we have all of these public goods. On the 4th of July, it's good if you don't have a dog or a toddler that there are fireworks. Neat. Yay, fireworks. Um, you don't have to pay for it. Um, but like, there are, are good societal benefits that you get from that. Um, but again, these will naturally be underprovided by the market because it incentivizes free riding and nobody's going to want to pay for it because there's no benefit that you get from paying for these things. And so you run into something called a public goods market failure or a public goods problem where things that should be provided by society will be underprovided because the incentives are misaligned and there's not enough money to pay for these things. And so it's an important market failure to pay attention to and to attempt to fix. Um, the way you fix these things generally is just to have the government suck up the cost and pay for it. Um, the U.S. Postal Service is a public good, technically. It's supposed to be non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Anybody should have access to send a letter anywhere in the country. Even if you're sending it to the middle of rural Alaska that's only accessible with like a snowmobile, um, constitutionally that should happen and so you can't exclude anybody from accessing that system and at a low scale if not all of us are sending a million packages a day it is non it is non rival um, if you send one additional envelope it's not going to slow down the whole postal system uh, kind of like if you get on the freeway it's not going to cause a traffic jam um, and so at a low level it is a public good um, and so when you have companies like FedEx and UPS that are trying to compete, once they get into the middle of Alaska land um, and they don't want to spend the extra money to get a fancy snowmobile that will take packages inland. And so they actually outsource those packages to the U.S. Postal Service and have them take care of it. Because the incentives, again, are to rely on the public infrastructure, to rely on these public goods and essentially free ride on them um, because that's why they exist. Um, so the only way that works is through some sort of public subsidy and public support for these public goods. Otherwise, they'll be underprovided by the market.